This is the United States Energy Association Power Sector Podcast Brief. I'm your host, Herman K. Trabish. I've covered the power sector since 2006, and I currently report for Utility Dive. My guest on the brief today is Colorado State Senator Chris Hansen, who had distinguished academic and private sector careers in energy before being elected to the Colorado Assembly in 2016 and the Colorado Senate in 2020. In his legislative career, Senator Hansen has sponsored key laws to advance the state's clean energy economy and to require its utilities to consider participation in a Western regional transmission system and energy market. In USEA podcast brief number 19, we're gonna talk with Senator Hansen about the Colorado perspective on the value and challenges of building a regional system to coordinate the 38 independent power producers from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Coast. We're also gonna talk about the two initiatives, one by the Plains-based Southwest Power Pool, or SPP, and the other from the California Independent System Operator, or CASO, to build an organized West-wide system. Senator Hansen, why are the West power providers, unlike most in the East, so isolated? Your law requires Colorado's utilities to consider the potential of a Western regional organization, but is regionalization possible in the West? Can the potential benefits from shared resources and costs change attitudes? Yeah, Herman, it's a great question. And you know, it's, it's something that I feel like is the linchpin of our transition to a clean energy economy in the West. And you're right, we start with 38 subgrids and they badly need to share and coordinate. And, you know, most of the load in the United States is inside an RTO or an ISO, uh, independent system operator. And the West is really the outlier among the rest of, of the country. And so it's really important that we move that direction. And in fact, the statute that we passed, along with a very similar law in Nevada in 2021, uh, requires our operators. Uh, so it's not just a consideration. They have to be in an RTO uh, pending PUC approval. So it's a very strong policy statement that we think that is the way we need to go to maximize the efficiency of this clean energy transition. Uh, okay, but but what is going to change their attitudes? They've always been so intransigent about staying independent. What's going to change their attitudes? Well, I, look, I, I think, uh, you know, statute changes attitudes. Uh, it is a legal requirement for them, um, uh -huh. including, you know, all the operators in Colorado and in Nevada. You've got a very similar approach being done in Nevada. It's been studied in Oregon. We've got momentum now that we have not had in the West after several failed attempts uh, around uh, the, end of the year 2000. And so, you know, I think we have a, a great amount of interest now in this topic. And I think the operators themselves are seeing the, uh, the reliability, uh, operational efficiencies, the ability to share the renewable resources across the region, uh, huge uplift for them and for the customers ultimately. And, you know, we need a grid that's bigger than the weather. Uh, because we've got a lot of additional wind and solar coming into the system. And so having a bigger grid that can handle uh, that intermittency of those individual sites is exactly what this moment calls for. And of course, the IRA and the other federal action that the DOE is doing is, is also uh, helping to add momentum here and the urgency for, for this change. And so, you know, I really see, I guess, the stars aligning in a way that they haven't before. Uh, and very excited about uh, seeing this work move forward over the next several years. I, I, you know, that's a great line, a grid bigger than the weather. So SPP and CRISO have organized power producers into real-time energy markets and are moving toward day-ahead energy markets. And they both seem to have full regional market ambitions. But studies have shown the benefits of a single regional system are greater than having two regional systems. Do you see the SPP and CAISO efforts as competing or complementary, and will they benefit or impede Western regionalization? Yeah, Herman, it's, this is a really important question. I mean, I, I think what's interesting is if you look at what's happened in the Eastern Interconnect uh, with the, the SEAM agreements that have been formed between different RTOs, I think the answer is it could go either way. And I think in the West, it's really important that uh, if we have multiple system operators, and that's okay, but we need to make sure we've got 
great theme agreements between them. And so I don't really start into this work with a, it must all be one or it must all be two. Maybe it actually ends up being three. There's lots of different ways this could play out. But the point is we need RTOs in place in the West to handle uh, this energy transition and to provide better efficiency and lower emissions. Uh, and so if it's one, two or three RTOs, uh, you know, let's stay open to that. But if we have multiple ones, we need to make sure we have seam agreements that can really work. And the Eastern Interconnect has proven that we can do that. Uh, and so I'm not too worried about that final configuration. Well, um, I got to ask you, who's number three? Who's number three? You, you, you mentioned number one, SPP and CAISO are number one and two. But you said three, and I got, is, is number three the Colorado-based uh, uh, organization that some people have talked about? Well, yeah, that's one of the options, Herman. You know, there there is a group in Colorado of, of, that has been leading on this uh, and has participation from across about a half dozen states in the West. So I, I do think there is a door number three, so to speak, if we go back to the old game show. Um, I, I don't think it has to be, you know, option one, option two. I think there are other options available. Um, I think a big linchpin here is will C California have any regulatory reform when it comes to how CAISO is is governed. Um, everyone right. can see it clearly. We, ha we have to have statutory change there. That's been very difficult in Sacramento. Um, without that, no one else is going to join CAISO. Uh, why would they if they don't have a, the ability to be part of the governing board? Um, and so, you know, again, I don't want that to hold us up in the West. Um, if CAISO doesn't lower the drawbridge, uh, then, you know, we can move forward and figure out a seam agreement. Uh, if they do, then great. Uh, let's all cooperate. Um, I think either way, in my lifetime, we're headed to an intercontinental grid. So, you know, let's just think long term here and step by step. I think we can get there. Um, whether California can do that reform in the near term, I don't know. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, I certainly have friends in California who are working hard on that. Um, but even if they don't, the West needs to move forward and we can figure out a seam agreement later. So. It, it, it's it, we could do a whole day seminar on the on the advantages and disadvantages of SPP, a Colorado based system, California and the CAISO proposals. If, you, if there's any way to summarize it, what are the advantages for uh, Colorado folks in participating with SPP? What are the advantages of the, for Colorado utility and power providers for uh, participating in the CAISO markets? And and what are the advantages from this uh, door number three? Yeah, can you know, you summarize I summarize that. Sure. I, I think for Colorado, it can work in any of those configurations, whether it's door number one, two or three. Um, Colorado has a huge amount of wind and solar resources. We've got some great pumped hydro. Uh, we've got a uh, lot of new storage that's coming online and some operators that are very adept at, at maximizing those resources. So I think it, as, as we move toward an RTO, I think Colorado can prosper in any of those situations. We're kind of a keystone state in the grid, uh, mixing east and west. Um, again, we need a grid bigger than the weather. We've got great uh, amount of wind power on the plains, uh, including in my home state of, of Kansas. Um, and SPP, you know, would like to have a chance to, to share those resources. And I, and I think Colorado is, is an important part of that puzzle. So I, again, I don't think there's a, it must be this way, uh, but I do think as we move toward these, these different options, we can look at the cost benefit. And that's really been one of the biggest hangups here is how do you do cost allocation uh, with the current system? And the answer is you can't. Very hard to get these interstate transmission projects done uh, because nobody's got enough vested interest to do it under the current 38 you know, subgrids. Um, and that's why an RTO or ISO construct is so badly needed. So, you know, I, I'm excited about these possibilities. You've got some independent transmission companies, ITCs, that are coming forward with some great interconnection ideas, uh, perhaps even going across the east-west uh, interconnect line, bringing wind from the plains uh, into Colorado and the west when it when it makes sense. So huge opportunity here, billion-dollar projects that that have great economics uh, we just need to get the governance in place and and the regulatory environment, uh, and I and I have no doubt the market can deliver a great result. You've mentioned uh, California's governance situation as a barrier to a looking for Colorado looking to the west. Um, I've heard that there are utilities that own that own transmission and earn revenues from it, 
and they they don't want to be an original organization and uh because that would require them to share those revenues is that a, a barrier that that one or the other options might uh, be able to solve uh and the other question is is there some kind of political self-interest in some states' resistance to cooperating with their, their neighboring states? In other words, these are some of the barriers that I've heard about. Do you consider them barriers? Is there any other significant barrier? Yeah, Herman, all of those are true. Uh, there are, yeah, the, the kind of, I have mine and I don't want to share, absolutely. So I think that's the challenge for a new RTO or ISO is how do we get the cost and benefits fairly allocated and have, you know, the, the winners uh, be able to compensate the losers. And, and that is going to happen no matter how, you, you know, whichever door you pick, whether it's one, two or three here. Uh, there will be winners and losers. And so that's the challenge on the governance side and the cost allocation side for any new RTO is to, is to make sure we get that get that done correctly. And, and I think it can be. I mean, we've got examples of it all over the world where it has worked uh, uh, and we can learn from those and, and take best practices and implement it in a way that works for the West. So that's what we've got to stay focused on. And really the stakes could not be higher um, we have to uh, integrate gigawatts of new wind, solar, and batteries. And the cheapest, best way to do that is within a, a regional construct. And so we have to keep our eyes on that prize and, and just keep working through these cost allocation issues. But you're absolutely right. Uh, there are going to be uh, folks who feel like they're winning or losing. And, and figuring out that equation is, is the, the regulatory and, and political challenge of, of this moment. Yeah. So it's interesting because FERC is working on those same issues. Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is working on those same questions uh, for, for the East and for the regional organizations that already exist. And all of these folks, SPP, ISO, others in the West are working on these questions. And we're all, it seems like everybody's moving toward a solution. Does that mean that Western regionalization can be a linchpin to that uh, intercontinental transmission system that you mentioned a little, a little earlier? Oh, for sure. I, yeah. And, and, and again, I'm just trying to think, you know, 50 years from now or 40 years from now, um, I think the, the economics, the way the technology is headed, we, we are going to need an intercontinental grid. Um, and it just feels inexorable in my mind from an uh, economic and technology standpoint. And so now it's time for policymakers and regulatory agencies you know, to, to take the initial steps in the West to, to move us in that direction. And the upside for the planet is enormous. The upside for the customer is enormous. So there are, are big pots of gold at the end of this rainbow, I think, from every engineering analysis I've ever seen. Um, but these are tough problems and, and these are tough initial steps. Um, and that was really the reason I decided to run the bill in 2021 and work with Senator Brooks in Nevada to do the same thing, because I felt like we needed to get off the starting line um, and we needed sort of a, a statutory push uh, to get things moving. And, and I think that has largely happened. There's a there's a momentum here that hasn't been seen in at least 25 years. And so. Um, I, I, as you can probably tell from today, I'm really optimistic about it. It's not to gloss over the difficult hurdles in front of us, um, but it, you know this is the, the the challenge of our moment, and I, I'm confident we can meet it. Well, hopefully, we'll we'll have leaders like you who not only appreciate the upside, but also appreciate the downside for the planet and for customers uh, if they don't get moving. But that's all the time we have, Senator Hansen. I've got to thank you for sharing your really unique uh, and a visionary, somewhat visionary perspective on the emerging efforts to build a West-wide power system and the implications of that.